So today I want to talk about Cisco's versus Arista litigation. It's been settled. They've agreed to dismiss all litigation against each other. What's it look like in the wash-up? That's what I want to talk to you about today. Cisco uh, brought a lawsuit against Arista Networks back in 2014, asserting that Arista had stolen a bunch of technologies around SysDB, the command line interface, and certain specific features in networking that Cisco had patented over the years. In general terms, the settlement basically announces that a five-year deal not to bring any more patent or copyright infringement suits against each other, a three-year deal to use arbitration to resolve any patent disputes that may arise for new products, so Cisco gets uh, Arista gets a five-year moratorium. They can operate for five years without any fear of further lawsuits. A three-year deal to use arbitration. If Cisco feels like it's got something that it can beat uh, Arista over the head with, it's got three years to do so. And then Arista will pay Cisco 400 million. Let's look at why Arista would do that. And the answer is that uh, when Cisco brought the lawsuit against Arista back in 2014, they launched it in two courts. Uh, one was in the uh, patent law. Uh, in the US law courts, and that is well known to take many years to resolve. Cisco wanted to get something on the board early, and the other one, so what they did was also launched lawsuits in the International Trade Commission, where if you can go to the International Trade Commission and assert that your patents are being abused and somebody's making money off them, you can get them prevented from being imported into the US. That's a fairly standard legal procedure from what I heard. It's not an unusual one. If you want to get some patent relief, if somebody's breaching your patents, you want to prevent them from making money while you go through the law process. If you can prove to a court that you have a right. Now, the ITC ultimately ruled for Cisco in a couple of issues. It threw a number of other issues out, as is usual. You bring a lot of them. Most of them don't hold water. The judge won't consider them or the, or the court won't consider them. But a few of them it did, and certain of uh, Arista's products were suspended for a few months before they were re-imported. Arista was able to work around it. At the time, when it happened, Cisco launching this case back in 2014, it really seemed like a really personal thing. It seemed like somebody was felt that Arista was taking away someone's cheese. And over time, I think that's still true. It's also fair to say that Cisco has been unable to land a killing blow in this loss in the court case. Nearly all of the matters brought before the US Patent Court have been dismissed. Uh, that is that Cisco's assertions of patents haven't been successful, uh, including you know most of the more important ones or the more obvious ones. But the ITC did, and but what Arista did was was able to go around it, right? Was able to very quickly engineer their way around these early decisions and say, well, we could change our CLI a little bit, we could change the way our software operates so we're not breaching the patents that Cisco claims to have. And then if there's features where there seems to be a strong case, then they just pulled them out of there. One of those is private VLANs, which at one point um, Arista was saying to customers, we're just going to pull this feature out completely. We're very sorry we don't have it because of Cisco's court case. So we're sort of four and a half years, five years down the track from that. And it doesn't look like Cisco was actually going to win. And increasingly, Cisco was seen as validating Arista as a competitor. And in the four years since 2014, Arista, if you have a look at this chart here, you can see that Arista claims that their market share has continued to go up as Cisco's market share goes down. Now, some of this is lies and statistics for sure, but it makes the fundamental point that Arista's business was not damaged by this court case. It was able to continue to grow, and its share price certainly reflects that it's managed to grow in spite of Cisco taking on this court case. Custom Customers clearly did not abandon Arista and all stopped moving to Arista, and certainly there was some disruption. Keep in mind, Arista has been very successful with cloud providers, and this sort of stuff doesn't really affect them. They're big enough to get involved if they need to, and they're not using features that Cisco could claim were specific to Cisco. They're often using much more open systems. And Arista has been making that you know inroads into the enterprise data center, and perhaps this did have some slowdown. Arista pulled back a bit to focus on the cloud providers, but that worked out good for Arista in the long run because Cisco is not able to get into Azure or uh, AWS or Google or any of those types of companies. What it did feel is it was it was a John Chambers era move. John Chambers was well known for being quite. Uh, spiteful if people were to turn on him. For those of us who remember, uh, there was when Nasira came onto the market, what later became VMware's NSX. At the time that EMC bought it, that is Joe Tucci at EMC bought the company, uh, Nasira had nearly completed a deal. 
according to the article on the screen, uh, to go with Cisco. And then EMC came along and bought it out from underneath them so that it could grow the VMware market. There was quite a lot of animosity from that point forward between Cisco and EMC. And there's quite a few uh, articles out there, if you search them up, of a deteriorating re relationship between Cisco and EMC that started around about uh, 2014 timeframe. And uh, so a lot of what we're sort of seeing here is that certain people involved in the Cisco senior management were cap capable of quite personal responses to certain things that happened in the market instead of taking a much more mature and say, you know, we need to react to this. And that sort of time frame is when the Arista court case came along. And we, I do believe we're actually seeing that sort of thing here, that there's a personal aspect of getting even or getting back at people. And that's part of what this court case was about. Cisco didn't want to see another Nasira where it lost out on a key component of its strategy. In the end, of course, the Nasira losing Nasira meant that uh, Cisco had to race ACI to market. And, you know, really, that that hasn't been a success. Nasira has gone on to become VMware's NSX, which is now becoming a threat. Following the start of the court case in 2014, Cisco did start to promote ACI quite heavily. And uh, sadly, that product didn't really come out the way it was expected. It wasn't quite what was hoped for. It had obviously been birthed a little bit too early. Uh, the product wasn't very stable, but Cisco felt an urgent need to bring it to market. They felt the competitive pressure from Nasira, in my view, and also from Arista. Arista was basically making chassis switches that were marginally, you know, probably more stable and reliable according to the feedback that I've heard at a slightly cheaper price and having good quality tech, very simple, very focused company. And the advantage of a small company is always that it's focused on a single thing. Cisco, of course, is very diverse. It's got multiple things and it just wasn't able to compete with a company that just wanted to make switches, do a single thing and do it very well. And people started to go to Arista. So that sustained the court case after the initial effort. And I think over time, as Arista sort of proved out that, you know, um, it was able to keep competing regardless of the pressures applied from Cisco both as a sales because um, we saw a massive sales response from Cisco as they attempted to target Arista and to take them down in the deals and get very aggressive on pricing according to the information I've heard but never really able to have uh, any impact on Arista sales. So ACI, you know, still doing well for Cisco. It's a a multi-billion dollar business but I don't think it's achieved the goals that Cisco wanted and in 2014 that was the key time frame when uh, you know uh, Nasira was acquired by VMware which they turned into NSX which has been modestly successful um, and Arista continued to eat away at Cisco's core data center business and but has particularly had an impact in the cloud uh, causing further problems for Cisco internally so that sustained the court case then uh, probably up until about 2017. At the end of the day though Arista was making products that customers wanted there's not much innovation in their products. They're fundamentally just making a better switch than Cisco can. And, uh, you know, customers have voted with their purchase orders. Cisco also is not just a networking company. In 2018, really what we're seeing is that Cisco isn't just about networking anymore. It much more sees its future in other technologies. So in the last couple of years, with Chuck Robbins in control, he's sort of looking at the enterprise IT and particularly at networking and realizing, I think, um, that there isn't 10, 20% growth there. If he needs to find more revenue and as networking shrinks generally, and Cisco's seeing 5% shrinkage quarter on quarter for quite some period of time, maybe it's slowed down by now. We don't know, they don't break it out in their results. But if you look at Cisco's investments, it's bought companies like uh, Jasper for over a billion dollars, which is an IoT platform, AppDynamics for $3.2 billion, which is an application monitoring platform. Uh, Duo Security is a recent purchase for over $1.2 billion um, to boost their security portfolio. The last major purchase was Viptela over two years ago for 600 million to add SD-WAN to its existing portfolio. In fact, we've just recently seen that Viptela will now run on existing routers. So it won't sell new hardware. It won't set great new sales. It's now just become a feature on the existing. They'll get some sub licensing revenue, I suspect, but it won't be much more than that. Cisco's not really a networking company, so why would Chuck Robbins continue to do this? It's much easier just to put this behind them. 400 million in cash is a tidy chunk of, of change, and neither company really gets anything out of this. Arista has to pay 4%, 400 million, but their share price pops by 760 million, so Cisco won't be happy. As soon as there was a deal announced, their share price went up by twice the penalty they had to pay. There, yes, there's a gap between cash flow and share price, but still not a bad little deal. Um, Cisco doesn't get what it wanted. It doesn't get Arista to give up using the CLI. And, you know, increasingly the CLI doesn't matter. The SDN 
um, is steadily eating its way in. We're not going to be configuring switches in the future. Look at Cisco with its SD access. It's saying configure the campus using software, ACI in the campus, even Arista with its cloud vision in SD-WAN and with Meraki. It's all about software to configure your networks, not the CLI. And so much of what the course case was about become largely relevant to customers on the ground. We don't see any difference about them. Now, I'm pretty sure that Cisco sales reps who are very prone to exaggeration or telling tall tales will be out there saying they won the court case. They most certainly did not. Cisco certainly has backed down here. They were very aggressive in the court case, in my opinion. They did fully expect to be able to take Arista down in a major way to impact sales, to cause it to have troubles in the market. And they've done none of those things. Uh, at this point, Arista has admitted to no wrongdoing and has never been never demonstrated anything other than producing a better switch that runs like the Cisco CLI. Did they steal the Cisco CLI? Not in my opinion. Ultimately, Cisco has been telling companies out there to use its CLI for a long period of time. It's been a competitive advantage for them, I believe, to have um, other companies using their CLI because it reinforced their dominant position in the market. And I suspect that in the court cases, they were telling people that, um, you know, that Arista would be saying to the court that everybody's been using the CLI because Cisco made it possible for us to do that. And everybody's been doing it, so why would we get singled out? Now, I don't know if that's true, but that certainly would be my expectation. The Cisco iOS CLI has been fairly standardized for a very long period of time. Um, so at the end of the day, nobody wins. Arista's had the damage done. Cisco sales reps will go out and exaggerate this and claim that they won and that Cisco was copying them. I don't think customers care, or nor should they. Um, Cisco hasn't had any admission. They haven't got what they wanted, um, which means it's almost the perfect lawsuit, really. When you Most of the time when a legal settlement comes up, everybody should be unhappy. That's what we've got. Where do we go from here? I think Cisco will be out there knocking on your door, attempting to sell you more SDN, more subscription licenses attempting to raise, get you to churn out all of your existing products. And Arista will be there doing the same thing, offering you a similar type of product at a cheaper price. Perhaps it's a better quality product. People certainly suggesting that their focus on reliability and stability and quality control around the software has been a powerful selling tool for them. And uh, it's up to you to decide. That's my view. Uh, just to wrap up, sort of a summary of a lot of different things, but I hope that's been helpful to you. My name's Greg Farrow. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Packet Pushes podcast. If you like this, perhaps you'd like to go over to packetpushes.net and see much more like this. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it.